It's a bit odd when I don't hear anything on this end. So uh, that is the new opening that we're featuring. So happy to have that working. Hopefully everybody heard the sound and music, not sound of music, but sound and music of the, the opening. Hans and Caitlin Greasy are in the house from Colorado. Harjus Harjus, I don't know who that individual is. Jeff and Jane Greasy uh, are also in. Jim Brubaker, how are you? All from Colorado. Julie Fogarty, Chicago. Mike L, Peter Glick, and more coming. This is episode 64. For those of you that don't remember the great Chicago Bear, Ted Albright. Ted was the lineman during the 70s and 80s when I grew up in Chicago. Uh, so we try to name Christopher episodes after famous Chicago Bears and this week's uh, offensive lineman, Ted Albrecht. Ted is actually, I believe, the Northwestern football team analyst for WGN Radio. But 64 weeks in a row, we've been zooming into your living rooms, patios, lanais, uh, campers, and we couldn't be more excited to have you with us this week. We are gonna be discussing caves and the influence of caves on wine. And for those of you that are new to Cellar Angels, let me share with you a little bit about who we are and, and what we do. We are a wine curator, a wine curator that specializes in Napa and Sonoma wines only. And we actually source those wines from small limited production wineries that are more often than not, not distributed nationally across the United States. So you aren't going to find these wines anywhere in the um, your local grocery store, your local wine store. And we do this basically to one, help these wineries grow and reach a larger audience. But two, and more importantly, the nice thing about it is that every single transaction, whether it's on our marketplace or whether it's in one of our three quarterly wine clubs raises money for charity. So I think it's important to show you what everyone is drinking tonight because tonight we have what's affectionately referred to as a Scotland. Scotland Kiefer, one of our longtime customers, is fond of opening up two bottles for a Friday night tasting. So we just nicknamed this after him. But if you ever navigate over to the Cellar Angels website, you can go to the wines page and the shop page and hit wine all. And you'll see that tonight we're featuring White Rock Claret and also in the sip kit was the Chardonnay. So we're gonna talk up, down, sideways about both these wines, the producer, and speaking of the producer who is also instrumental in the shot behind me because this is his cave, it gives me a great, great pleasure to finally welcome to the program Christopher Van Dendrich of White Rock Vineyards. Christopher, how are you, sir? Hi, everybody. I'm doing great. Awesome. Good to see you. Thank you so much, Nelson Holden, sir. How are you doing? Mike L., good to see you. Doug Rutherford from Minnesota, if you are in Minnesota, uh, happy to see you as well. I wanted to talk, Christopher, first of all, about White Rock. We'll get into the caves, but you guys have been in, in the wine business for a long time. Now, it's your father, it's, it's your brother. T kind of tell people a little bit of the background of, of how you got the name and how you got into wine. Well, uh, my, uh, my parents bought White Rock in 1977. So um, I... Uh, have been, uh, my brother and I took over winemaking about uh, 22 years ago now. He, he uh, my brother grows the grapes and I make the wine. Um, and, uh, but we grew up here on this farm, this, uh, and it's, it's been called White Rock since the 1870s when they first planted the grapes. So it's, it's one of the oldest wineries in Napa. Uh, there's a white, there's a building made of the White Rock, the old White Rock winery made of blocks of, of, of our rock. And, uh, that it was our house when I was a kid. Um, and uh, it's my parents' house now. So we grew up here, it was always farmed organically because my father always said, why would I spray chemicals around uh, the playground? So we ran around the vines and, and uh, so it just kind of came naturally that way. And then both of us went off and did other things in life and then somehow um, ended up back here um, 22 years ago now taking over production. Well, and. It's, it's interesting because those people that know Cellar Angels know we are fond of limited production, family run wineries, and you guys have that hands down. And one of the things I, I think is fascinating is how you matriculated into wine. And I'm going to launch a poll question uh, with regards to uh, a little bit of, of your background and you, you know, when it's funny because 
when I grew up, if you wanted to play basketball, you went to the Ray Meyer DePaul Blue Demons basketball camp, or you went to some, uh, there was the famous tennis coach down in Bradenton, Florida that you went to. And I don't know where you go to for wine. You know, it's not exactly like there's a wine camp you can go to as a, as an underage person, but you went essentially to a lot of great places and worked harvest. And I think that's from a matriculation standpoint, this is the poll question. I want to give people the background of Christopher, which of the below wine regions has Christopher not worked a harvest? Champagne, Rioja, Burgundy, Bordeaux, or Mendoza? And I'll let folks get their computers because this is early for a poll question because I didn't want you to actually answer that in advance. Uh, so uh, I think, you know, people want to specialize in Cabernet, they might go to a certain place. They want to specialize in Chardonnay, they might go to, to Burgundy and stuff like that. But you've actually been very, very well-rounded. And so I'm going to give this uh, 10 more seconds, five more seconds, four, three, two, one. Very split. So some people said you haven't worked in Champagne and some people said you haven't worked in Mendoza. Uh, what's the real answer? Champagne. Champagne. So you've worked Harvest in Rioja, Burgundy, Bordeaux, Mendoza. Uh, you were for Chateau Pop Clement in, in Bordeaux, among others. How did you decide to go over there? Well, my father is French. He came to the United States to go to UC Berkeley. Uh, and then he married a California girl. and. Uh, uh, so ended up in California, and but it's always been part of our family culture. So um, after college, I, I, I'm a French citizen as well as an American citizen. It was uh, reasonably easy for me to go back and go to school. And uh, uh, so um, it was, I was very lucky. My guess is you speak fluent French? I do speak French, yeah. All right, uh, if, if I were gonna wanna take French at the age of 55, what do you think the uh, learning curve is? Uh, if you fully immerse yourself, you'll learn very quickly. And let's if, say I don't. If, if you weekend myself. it, then forget it. <laughs> <laughs> so it's either full immersion or nothing is what you're telling me. <laughs> For most people, I, I would say that's true. I don't have a prayer then. Uh, so, so you went and you, you worked harvest and made wine in all these different areas and kind of did you did you pick up different things from each area or each specific winemaker? Tell me a little bit about the learning process. Well, in both, in both Burgundy and Bordeaux, I was in a work study in work study program. So I was working three weeks out of the month and then in school for one week. So um, I think that the most important thing of learning about wine is the doing of the winemaking, learning how different uh, physical activities or physical exertions on the wine change the flavor and then tasting the wine before and after and learning how wine changes in the barrel and the bottle. So that's, that's the big thing that I learned. Uh, I mean, I had really great mentors in Burgundy and Bordeaux and they, they certainly helped um, you know, guide me in the right direction. Um, but it's, I think in the end when you, uh, you know, Bordeaux and Burgundy wine is very, very different than California wine. So it's, uh, it's pretty hard to just go, go come from Bordeaux, have certain techniques and a, and a quiver of, uh, of of winery uh, activities and then be able to apply it directly to California wine. So in the end, uh, it's, you, it's sort of like, um, what are you doing in, if for your bachelor's in college? You're learning how to learn. You're not necessarily learning the thing that's gonna teach you, um, that's gonna be the, your job for the rest of your life. And so in many ways, when you go and do internships like that, you're learning a hundred different ways to, to do things and how flavors change. And then you get to go to a new place and apply them. So there's a lot of experimenting that goes on um, after your, when you start a job at a winery, you're just a, in full experiment. And so, and uh, Jeff says your name sounds more Dutch than French. It's a Belgian, Belgian name. So Flemish is the, the language of that part of Belgian. And that's where Vondendrich comes, comes from. It actually means of the meadow. In, oh, I like uh, it. Flemish. Very nice. Uh, and how often does it get mispronounced? Every time. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Uh, so you got to beg 
uh, borrow and learn little tidbits from each of these places in Burgundy and Bordeaux and, and Mendoza and, and Rioja and you know all of the great wine regions of the world. Then you come back to California and was your father at all apprehensive about turning you loose in the vineyards or, and, and to run things and make wine? I believe, I believe the exact words were, go make your mistakes elsewhere. <laughs> strong wisdom. I, I've heard that a few times. So uh, yeah, so I, when I came back from, from France, I, I, my first job was working, uh, was working uh, with John Kongsgaard and Dave Ramey. Uh, they, were, they were starting their two brands uh, at a, a custom crush facility called Luna Vineyards. And I was their production winemaker and they were the sort of high and mighty executive winemakers starting their projects. And they're in many ways to me, they're the, like the angel and the devil of Napa Valley Chardonnay. Uh, had one on each shoulder, both telling me to do something different. And so it was an extraordinary um, educational period for me, the first couple of years with them, uh, learning how to make two extremely different but very fancy styles of Chardonnay in Napa Valley. Do either um, of them know which character they are? <laughs> I think they both want to be the devil if I know those. <laughs> <laughs> That's fantastic. Well, you're, you're absolutely right about uh, Kongsgaard and Ramey's style uh, being two, I, I mean, opposite ends of the spectrum, so to speak, but both of them have achieved unbelievable acclaim for the, for the uh, offerings they produce. What were you stylistically able to, to kind of take from each of them to say, okay, I, I like, these three elements from John, I like these from Dave, and or or was it just a you know a hodgepodge of things before you came back to Dad and said, okay, I, I think I can take a, make a go of this. I mean, I think I think ultimately the job of the winemaker is to sort of uh, listen to the grapes that you have and figure out how to how to coax them into a natural balance, and because each grape you know each each vineyard is very different. I, the wrong way to make wine is to already know how to make it before you start. Mm. You have to, you have to have a lot of, uh, you have to have experienced a lot of different ways that wine changes and a lot of different kinds of wine. And then you have to so you take your grapes and even year by year, you can't determine exactly how to make it. It's, you know, some years you need to build mid palate and some years you need to kind of force the wine to be more focused and not build too much richness. So there's a lot of, um, I, t I learned a lot of techniques and I watched wines evolve. And then I took those back to the family business where I, you know, I already had big, big shoes to fill here and um, a style of wine that was built on minerality um, that's very specific to the white rock soil here. And then I tried to, to coax the wines in the direction of balance, starting from where they, how they express themselves during fermentation. Well, and, and you talk about the different attributes of stylistically and things you've learned from Dave and John and, and then I love the attitude that you just mentioned with regards to when you make wine, you have to not think you know how to make wine because you have to have the product first in the vineyard. And your vineyard adds another element to the overall mix of, of tools and, and procedures and processes. Talk us specifically about the uniqueness of the White Rock Vineyard, because it's obviously named for a certain type of uh, soil and rock. But tell everybody a little bit about that and, and why it's special. Well, I mean, White Rock is named for the white volcanic tooth that grows here. It's uh, technically a volcanic breccia, which is a sort of a redeposited stone. It's, it fell down as ash during volcanic, volcanic eruptions and then was crushed into stone again. And um, it's a very high uh, mineral soil. There's a lot of silica, um, volcanic soil, slightly acidic pH. Um, and it just, throughout all the wines, through all the varietals, reds and whites, uh, there is a core of minerality to the flavor that's really distinctive. Um, they do really well on the, in sort of more of the European style, that sort of focused, um, complex uh, style of, of wines. Um, and that minerality really comes out there. So um, that when I'm, when I, I mean, I'm thinking in many ways, I'll say that, you know, because my brother is the other half of this, this, of this production right now, and I have my main goal is to respect his work as much as possible. So uh, I try not to layer too much winemaking ego or flavor on top of the raw material. I just, I feel like my job is to take the natural flavor of our grapes and the wine that they make and, um, you know, add the 10 or 20% that makes it fully balanced and express itself. 
but I'm not trying to like dominate the wine and add a bunch of oak and butter and, you know, fruit and all sorts of other things that are not native to the vine. And tell everyone what your brother does. Well, my brother, Michael, farms the grapes. So he's the one that, uh, you know, makes them grow, that prunes them, that, uh, you know, micromanages every little part of the blocks. Um, and he and I work together to make sure that the art, the decisions in the vineyard and the winery um, you know, sort of have a synchronicity to them. So in other words, if I, if I think that my wines are too something, too rich or too tannic or too alcoholic or not strong enough or whatever, then we go back to the vineyard first and we say, how can we farm that a little bit differently in order to change the flavor in the, in the winery? Which is very different than many other winemakers who would try to find a winemaking solution to problems of balance. And um, that's one of the mo most rewarding things about my job working with my brother is that we get along well and, uh, and are able to sort of collaborate on these things. What is the age difference and who's older? Uh, he's younger, but he's more mature. <laughs> <laughs> he's two years younger than he's two years younger than I am. That's a very similar dynamic to my brother, who is two years younger than I am. And he says, I'm the youngest, but Martin's the baby. So I'm not certain what that means. It's not very nice of him. Uh, you, a question has arisen on the red wine. You call it a claret, which is a British name. And was curious, I mean, the British have called Bordeaux blends clarets for years. What, why did you name it a claret? Uh, so we've, we call it claret because we wanted to emphasize the fact that it's a Bordeaux styled and a Bordeaux reference blend. Uh, it, it only includes the Bordeaux varietals. It's, it's, it's only Cabernet, Cabernet Franc, Merlot, and Petit Verdot. Uh, and, uh, you know, really we're going for, and even before I took over, but I've certainly kept up the style. We're going for a wine that has lots and lots of complexity. Uh, it has a, a backbone. Um, it's not just plain fruit and soft, soft plush wine. It's got backbone and some angles and stuff that makes it a little bit gnarly and fun and dynamic in your mouth and pair well with food. Um, the, you know, our, I, I should say that our vineyard is a bowl in the hillsides just to the east of the main Napa Valley. And that, that um, bowl means that I have several sort of micro or even nano climates here. Um, the bottom portion, the bottom third of that bowl of the vineyard is quite cold. And the, the very flat part is not suitable for red grapes at all. In fact, I've got Merlot there that really never ripens. So it's a, it's a very distinct a little bit of Napa here where I have really, really ripe Cabernets coming from the hillsides. And at the very bottom, I've got Chardonnay that is perfectly cold climate Chardonnay, essentially, really focused and mineral. mineral. And then on the slopes towards the bottom, I've got Cabernets that grow in an area which most Napa Valley winemakers would think is too cold for Cab. Um, but the, from my perspective, that uh, if you consider it a blending wine, the, the Cabernet from there has, it doesn't have a lot of mid palate. It's not going to fill up your mouth with plush tannins, but it has this amazing sort of filigree of aromas and flavors. Uh, it's, it's a skeleton on which to build a wine and, um, and really nice uh, tannin structure. And so when I, when I blend that with Merlot and Cabernet Franc and the Petit Verdot fills in the mid palate and adds some sort of wild um, yeah, um, like roasted meat characters and it's uh, um, so it's really fun it's stylized like that to be a, a really complex wine I think that's one of the things you'll find about this player it's going to have everything from exotic spices a little bit of red fruit not so much of the darker plum but maybe a little bit uh, right. and then you know we're definitely you're going to have some some tobacco and um, uh, maybe a little bit of licorice uh, sometimes blueberry dill uh, but that's sort of more the, the Merlot component. Uh, well, and, so, and I, yeah. I jumped ahead of the, of the Chardonnay, but, uh, and Peter, I see your question. So we're going to get to that question, but I, I want to try to play a video that Christopher was kind enough to shoot of the cave. And there's caves seem to be persona non grata now in Napa and Sonoma. You, you're almost guilty if you don't have a cave uh, type of thing, but long before they became a, a status symbol, you have the White Rock Cave. And it was pioneered by an architect uh, that then went on to, to build quite Pine Ridges Cave was built after this. And, and this was the, the one that kind of set the bar. So I'm, I'm gonna play this video and then uh, Christopher, you can walk us through it. Well, I'll say my, my dad decided to build a cave. I think uh, he, he was actually born in a cave in Amboise, France as his family was escaping the Germans 
1939. And uh, so he grew up in a cave for the first you know, few months of his life and was always charmed by it. And, and uh, uh, this viewpoint is kind of fun if you're looking at the video now. This shows two different kinds of rocks side by side, which uh, uh, is just an, a wonderful little bit of geologic history there. That, that bottom gray portion used to be the surface of the earth and then a volcano deposited the red and dark stuff on top. So it's, a, um, it's kind of fun. You're, in, you're actually like in the Warren, in my little Warren, and you get to see these cool geologic features. Um, this, big stack of barrel, of barrels. this big stack of barrels that you're looking at here is one vintage of my production. It's about 200 barrels, about three, 3,500 cases of wine. And uh, so we only make wine from our vineyard, from, the, from White Rock Vineyards, the historic um, vineyard here. But my dad designed this cave uh, because first of all, caves have natural humidity and temperature control. You don't have to, to spend a dime on um, cooling or heating or humidifying the wines. And uh, it's just really ideal. Uh, I store, you can see these bottles of wine here. The bottle that you have in front of you was also stored here in the cave um, because it's actually a lot less expensive for me to keep the bottles here than to send them to a warehouse. So they're just very carefully, patiently aging there in the cellar. I, I keep about 50,000 bottles at a time as I rotate through the vintages. Some of the older vintages that we keep for our wine club and for re-release, like this 2015 Cabernet, um, is a wine that I'll start selling in 2015, 2025. That's the oh, wow. So we like to keep some back for re-release later on. Um, here's my little tank room. I'm sorry, my light bulb burned out. Um, <laughs> <laughs> no, that's fine. That's fascinating. Um, and, and it's interesting that you talk about the, the perfect environment from a humidity standpoint, temperature standpoint. And not many people know that there are a lot of geothermal hotspots in Napa Valley underneath the floor. And there's a lot of wineries on, on the Napa floor that are on these hotspots. And they have a whale of a time with costs trying to keep their their caves, not their caves, even their barrel rooms, um, cool. And it costs a heck of a lot of money to cool them. And that obviously then translates to the wine being a little bit more expensive. I'm gonna ask a, another question because not many people know that storing barrels in caves actually reduces evaporation. And it helps reduce evaporation because of exactly what you said. The humidity is near perfect, but barrels stored above ground in warehouses will lose on average blank of wine per year to evaporation. One cup, which is about a third of a bottle, a quart, which is almost a bottle and a half of 32 ounces, half a gallon. By the way, this is a poll question. Everyone can vote half a gallon, 64 ounces, or nearly three bottles of wine, a gallon of wine a year, 128 ounces, six bottles of wine, or slightly more than 10 beers, which most people would consume during the Packer Bear game first half. Uh, we have a lot of Wisconsin and Colorado people on, and, and they know Denver Broncos. So I'd be curious, uh, from an evaporation standpoint, we're gonna give this five, four, three, two, one. And interestingly enough, everyone knows there's some evaporation. And uh, I'm curious, Christopher, do you remember the correct answer? <laughs> uh, the correct answer is going to be somewhere between a half gallon and a gallon. Yeah, it's, it's the correct answer from a research thing that I did was a gallon of evaporation per barrel on a 60 gallon barrel. So when you think about that, that's a considerable amount of wine evaporating uh, in a barrel room above ground. And actually, something else that's interesting, I don't, I don't know how many of you people out there are science-minded folks, but you remember about partial pressures and evaporative pressures across membranes. But uh, the humidity, Do uh, I? if you have humidity on the outside of a barrel, that's all uh, water. And if you have uh, an alcoholic wa uh, wine uh, solution inside the barrel, then a more humid cave will actually encourage alcohol to evaporate and a less humid cave will encourage more water than alcohol to evaporate. So in a dry cave or a dry cellar, uh, you'll actually have an increase over the wine's life of up to one degree alcohol. Oh, wow. And, and if you have a wetter, more humid storage like you would in a cave, then you won't have any alcohol increase. And you can even have a decrease in alcohol depending on how 
uh, wet the caves are. So it's kind of fun to think that there's there's more than just the evaporation. There's real there's real changes in the way that these things evaporate and, and as they age. But I mean, that's I didn't even fathom that a gallon out of a 60 gallon barrel could actually evaporate. I mean, that's amazing. And if you're only making three or four barrels of wine, I mean, that is economically a significant amount. <laughs> uh, how long does it take to stack all those bottles? Uh, the stack, that stack behind you is 4,000 bottles and it takes four man days or women days. And they're not, none of them are labeled, correct? They're just shiners? Correct. They're shiners. So how do you know if some nefarious person doesn't switch something from the laureate to the claret? <laughs> we trust people. Um, <laughs> but I can, I'll tell you what I can tell from the, the bottle molds, uh, the, the bottle mold numbers and the kinds of corks and so on, but which is which. So I don't, there's no identical packaging, uh, at least to the, I know about distinctions in the packaging that make me recognize that is it. well I, and it's amazing i remember the first time i walked in there probably seven or so years ago it's just incredible uh the delicate nature of this and how they all fit perfectly so your father was way ahead of his time and you're right from an economic standpoint it makes perfect sense I think the other cool thing about caves is that is that we're in california earthquake country and and it turns out that solid rock is the safest place to be during an earthquake so this cave is, is, you know, hewn from the living rock, as they say in Spinal Tap. Um, and it's the, uh, it's really, uh, we've, I've been in the, in the cave during an earthquake and, and it, there's really very little movement. It's very stable. So, and I was in, uh, you know, I was in Santa Cruz, California during the earthquake in 89, when the, the big one. And oh, wow. I, I was not on rock at that point. And I watched the walls of a concrete building go back and forth by a foot and a half. So uh, I can, uh, being in a cave is, is, has many, many um, uh, benefits when it comes to wine storage. Yeah, that, that'll get your attention, concrete walls moving a foot and a half. <laughs> Speaking of the influence of this, your father, and, and I, I honestly think you get the desire and affection for caves from his birth. So I'm going to show uh, the cave house. And why don't you tell folks where this is? where he was born, by the way, in 1939, fleeing the Germans as they come in to occupy France. Uh, yeah, so um, this is in the, the cliffs on the banks of the Loire River in, um, in Amboise um, in France. And uh, these are, this whole section of the riverbank is these massive uh, tufa cliffs. There, it's a calcareous soil, limestone, limestone soil. And uh, for, for you know, millennia, people have been living there. And these days, they're very coveted houses. So people, people you, these go 30, 40, 50 feet deep into the mountain. And you have all these tunnels just carved out of white, uh, the white tufa. And uh, it, one of these similar places was one where my dad was born. That is outstanding. And they make great wine caves, by the way. So many of the Chinol wines that you might buy, Somer Champigny, uh, and other Loire wines from the um, Appalachian are made in caves like this. And, and uh, you know, the soil type is very different than the soil at White Rock. I mean, tufa and tuf, to be very confusing, are totally different soils. Um, but uh, they're both highly mineral. And that's one of the things that characterizes some of the wines of the Loire. Well, let's, um, we're talking a little bit about caves, but I do want to talk about the Chardonnay. And uh, I will do one thing real quick if I'm able to pull you know, it off. If you, if you had that, that um, picture of the video on your website, is that easy to pop up for a second? Of the Chardonnay? Uh, no, just of the, the, your video. You had the little play button and you had this, this view of the vineyard. Oh, of course. Now that you asked for that one, I don't have the right video. Oh, all right, that's okay. Yeah. Then I'd say if you if you play that video that I made earlier, I'll, I can explain over it. Okay, that I can do. Editing and technical on the fly. Let me uh, go ahead and grab that video. If you're following along at home, this is how not to edit a live production. All right, and where did it go? Yeah, so I, 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 while you're looking for it, I can tell that the, the Chardonnays are, um, are in a, quite a cold microclimate here for Napa Valley. 
most Napa Valley Chardonnays are growing in some pretty hot spots. That gives them that really rich, lush finish, um, slightly higher alcohols, um, and can, but uh, ours grow in this fog layer down at the very bottom of our vineyard, and it's just a really, uh, it makes a really intense and mineral focused Chardonnay uh, that uh, is pretty distinctive for Napa. And as, as so this video I took today, you can see what the vines look like right now. Uh, one of the things you'll notice is that the vines are pretty short, uh, and that's because we've had really bad drought here in California. Um, but what I'll point out is that, that you can, we're at the top of the hill here in our cave hill vineyard, looking down over our valley. Uh, this is a little picnic table where we do our tasting. So anyone that would like to come out and taste with us, we'd be happy to welcome you. Um, you can sit in the vineyard like this. Uh, be satisfied to know that you're sitting in the middle of an organic vineyard, so there's nothing going to be, no chemicals around you. But if you look down on the flat part there in the middle of that uh, picture right now, you're seeing the, the portion where the Chardonnay grows in a very colder, much colder area. The, the, this Chardonnay is fermented in oak barrels, but they're not new barrels. They're barrels that are at least four years old. Oh, wow. Uh, and the reason I do that is because I really want to, I don't want to add too much flavor on top of this natural white rock minerality and, and the wonderful fruit that it has. Uh, usually a, a combination of some um, stone fruit, um, peach, a uh, little bit of, um, uh, it could be lemon uh, in this 17. There's a um, sort of a bit of a melon character that's kind of nice. Uh, very, very cool uh, Chardonnay with lots of complexity. What is the age of the vines of the Chardonnay? The, the, those vines are 22 years old. Wow. And uh, interestingly, they're not a clonal selection. Uh, uh, you, you people probably know that most vineyards these days are all made from one solid mother, mother plant, a clone that is selected for, for its certain character. And this block is a block that was uh, pulled from grapes that my dad selected from all over, all over Napa Valley in the seventies. So he went to all the famous vineyards and he got a few vines and then he planted some of each vine in his block and that block was just mixed. Uh, so one of the nice things about that is that it, it really, uh, first of all, it doesn't taste like a single clone. It has a, com a complexity of many different kinds of mother plants. Um, and, so uh, it's like a field ways, blend of Chardonnay clones. It's a field blend of Chardonnay, exactly. Another thing that's nice about that is that it, 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 lets, it keeps the winemaker from exerting too much control over the, the pick date because all, different clones ripen on different days. And obviously I'm still gonna pick them all on one day. But that means I get, I get a, a little bit more, uh, I'm forced to build a little bit more complexity into the wine. Uh, it's, that's, that's a theory um, that comes out of Opus um, the winemaker there is big, uh, is big on complexity, and he and I have talked a number of times about this. And he loves to be forced to pick blocks at the same time because he feels like it, it takes him away from his own winemaking ego and puts the flavors more on the flavor of the, uh, of the vineyard. Right. It, it takes the thinking out of it. So you just have to pick and then go where, where the hand leads you. Yeah. Uh, speaking of uh, what we're going to do and going where the hand leads you. For those of you that would like to actually be on camera, Denise is going to elevate you to a panelist. And as she's doing that, we are going to take a little stroll uh, into Google Earth. Uh, and what is, I'm sorry, French for? Winemaker. Uh, oh, that's right. Uh, what is the French term for winemaker? Analogue. Pretty much. I mean, that's the wine scientist. Enologist is analogue. French. Yeah. You know, a vigneron would, would refer to the person who grows the grapes. And, and there's always, a, if you grow the grapes and make the wine, then you're also a vigneron. Got it. Uh, all right. Google Earth time. So we can show exactly where we're going with this. And then we're going to dig deep into the claret. Uh, and, and I have to agree. Uh, I love the Chardonnay. The 17 is aging fantastic. And it has uh, it does have the acidity that you talk about. It has the complexity. I, I do have some ramy notes in there. It has that, that full lush flavor and, and some of the Consgard acid and minerality. I mean, it's a delicious wine, Christopher. Thank you. Yeah, I'm really, really happy with that 17. And, I, and it, we, we sell it at this point on purpose. It's a, we, we love that as it starts to age, it gets a little bit of a honey character and the kind of a, more than just the fresh floral and fruit character. So that's a, I think it's really at a really nice point to drink right now. Uh, normally we wouldn't be, be selling the 18 Claret at this point, 
but we um, we didn't we didn't make very much in 17 because of the fires that came through Napa Valley, and so we we just sold out early. And I would I had been hoping to send you guys some 17, but unfortunately we just have been uh, the pressure from our customers has been too high, and so we released the 18 a little bit earlier, uh, which actually works for 18 because the 18 vintage is a is a lighter vintage that has aged well early. But um, anyway, normally it's a little bit odd, I suppose, to have the 17 and 18. Uh, that's okay. It, it works because of exactly what you said. I wanted to start this evening in France, where it all began and, and where you've worked for some amazing places. And so this is where your father was born in a cave house on the Loire River. And I, can, I can't even imagine in 1939 when, you know, France and Germany get engaged in, in battle and you have Alsace right over here right on the border and which is why some of the German Gewürztraminers and the Alsatian whites go back and forth and back and forth because I think this border has changed quite a few times uh, but that what you showed me with regards to the Loire River do you ever go back with the family? Uh, I brought my family back um, like a three three years ago we did a bunch of biking along the Loire it's a really fabulous place for tourism and it's a flat biking route so you can uh, people who aren't Big, big bikers can have a lot of fun doing it. We also That's went, we also went to the, uh, on the Danube at the same trip over by Dernstein near Vienna. There's just fabulous wines out there and the foodways are uh, extraordinary. I can only imagine. Uh, and when you say people that aren't in the biking can have a good time biking, that's got my name written all over it. <laughs> So that's good, especially since I don't have to be full immersion French. By the way, full, let's get back to full immersion French. Was that like I can do that in 30 days staying in France? Being Would I be conversational then? Is that a 90-day program? <laughs> that's a good question. I mean, I think it depends on you. It probably takes 90 days for most people. Uh, my, my mom is, was a French teacher, and we actually had American businessmen living in our house when we were kids doing French immersion with us and we would all speak French with them. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> these these that's poor great. guys, you know, but my mom is a wonderful cook. So I actually think they got, they got a pretty good deal. Yeah. They got to learn how to speak French and actually gain 10 pounds in the process. So there's nothing <laughs> wrong with that. So everyone knows that we focus on Napa County and Sonoma County and, and White Rock, Christopher mentioned it early is just a shade East of the town of Napa. So if I, zoom in on where that looks like you can see quickly i'll even back out a little bit so yeah, it just so, is up in the foothills yeah so you can there's see that there's it's just a little bit of a hill there it's only a couple hundred feet higher than the valley floor um this part of napa valley is the coldest nighttime temperatures because of the airflow at night and the cold air kind of develops over the top of this these uh Vaca Mountains, Stag's Leap is just here, right just north of White Rock. And that cold air kind of runs down these foothills and settles in these little valleys. Uh, and so one of the reasons that Stag's Leap makes wines that, are, that age really well is they do have a slightly cooler nighttime temperature than other parts of Napa. And that, that lends a little bit more structure and better acidity and, and allows the wines to age better. And I think it's interesting too, because there's a couple, uh, they may not be so hidden gems, but uh, there's places that we eat in the valley every single time we're there. And one of them is obviously right here at the Soda Canyon Grocer. So we stop in there. You probably uh, have, I don't know, maybe a house account over the last 35 years and have kept them afloat uh, because they've changed ownership a few times. It's a wonderful story. But this, the Oakville Grocer off of uh, Route 29, this is a great place to stop in, get sandwiches, get some refreshments. You can sit out back. There's a little space on the, on the river right here. Uh, but that that is a local legend, and and that's a good place. I highly recommend. But as you go up Soda Canyon Road here and and weave back through here, it is a very pretty drive. It's you know ten minutes, and then you will come to the White Rock Tasting and Vineyard, and this gives you an idea of the slope oh, of the boy. hill. Oh boy, that's quite a. That's quite a show you got there. That's the everything burned down <laughs> picture. Yeah. <laughs> this is October of 2020. And you're right. And the trees are gone. Uh, but here's the road that came off of Soda Canyon Road. You pull up into the driveway. Here's the tree with the picnic table underneath it that we saw earlier in the video uh, that Christopher was kind enough to shoot today. And, and it's a gorgeous walk on this terrace 
or this sloping vineyard to come out from the cave in here. They've got some uh, tents or some sheets over so you don't bake in the heat. You walk out here, you're in the shade, sitting amid the vineyards, all farmed sustainably. And uh, the view doesn't stink, I'll tell you that much. And the only thing that's better than view is the wine. So, so this is, uh, and, and what, what are you, I mean, you're literally 10 to 12 minutes outside of Napa. Yeah, yeah we're, we're, we're 12 minutes from downtown. Yeah. And from Yonville, about the same, either way. Awesome. It's a, it's a hidden gem and I'm, I'm a big fan uh, of this location and everything else. The, uh, you mentioned that caves are fantastic and earthquakes, how did caves, uh, how are they for fires? Well, I mean, the, the fact is that we did have a big fire come through here in 2017 and, our, and actually all of our buildings got burned down. Um, the, uh, but luckily the caves saved all the wine inside. So, uh, you know, we're very, very thankful that we had a cave for our winery. Uh, and yeah, and you plus can... the, the, the uh, you know, the climate change related uh, power outages that we've been having throughout California have also been a, main, a major problem for um, keeping the warehouses in Napa cool because the power goes out and then everyone's just reliant on generators that work maybe or don't maybe work so well. So uh, having a cave is key and, and they're very, very popular now, but it was really my dad's insight um, back then in, uh, in the eighties to, to decide to build one when it was unproven technology, but uh, really um, turned out to be the right thing. So you've got uh, one of the, the most unique caves. You were one of the early pioneers of caves. You've got uh, chalky soil that is not found near anywhere else in Napa. There's no geothermal springs like some of the other wineries have a problem. Uh, the cave is a perfect aging process. What is the hardest thing that you and your brother have encountered with actually producing the wines that you're producing? Well, this is, let's, let's talk, let's, let's face it, this is farming. And the, the, the grapes have a, have a different flavor depending on the weather and water and temperatures and humidities at all different times of the year. So spring temperatures affect flavor and fall temperatures and the winter before and, and the summer, everything. Is, uh, so the raw materials of wine are very different from year to year. Some of the molecules in wine are 50% less or 50% more from one year to the next. And when those are the flavor, develop, the flavor parts of your wine, I, you know, the most challenging thing in the wine business is being able to sort of have that full quiver of technique so that you can take the different raw materials and, and coax them into something that represents your brand. So it, 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 it's pretty rare in Napa to have, to have winery where you only make a state fruit like we do from one, from one big vineyard. Uh, very, very frequently people will have, a, every, pretty much all, most wineries in Napa have a, some vineyards in Calistoga and some vineyards in Carneros and some vineyards around Yapil. And in a, in a hot year, they blend more of the Carneros in and then the cold year, they blend more of the Calistoga in and they make wines that have the same flavor every year by taking advantage of the different climates in Napa Valley. And in, in the case of White Rock, we're, we have these extremely different raw materials and then the challenge of not just making a wine that tastes like White Rock, but making one that has its own individual balance. So you'll find if you drink several vintages of my wine, um, you'll find that that they're very different one from the other, and it's going to be vintage related differences. In fact, I'd be happy to put together like a vertical a vertical um, box of wine for anyone that's interested in trying the differences. But I could get a vertical Eclair and a vertical Chardonnay. That kind of thing would be really fun to look at and then sort of explore why they're different. And um, you know, this year we've had quite a bit of drought, and and the vines are a little bit smaller. So um, we know that the vines aren't big enough to run up to hold a full crop this year. There's just not enough leaves to photosynthesize. So we're dropping about a third of our crop right now. And uh, we know that that's enough to so where the, the remaining two thirds will ripen really well. Um, but that's just us, you know, kind of accepting the challenge and trying to help mother nature give us the good stuff. No, I, I like that idea of, of the vertical. And I'm, I mean, this has been, I'm going to put the, white label up here and it's you refer to it as a historic vineyard or a historic winery tell me about the historic aspect of it because i know there's been vines on this property since 1870 i believe yes so there's been vines here since 1870 that picture on the top of your bottles 
was drawn in 1883. So it's a real historical document um, that um, shows exactly what you see when you're here. Um, the, you'll see the same building when you sit out in the vineyard. And um, we, uh, it's kind of fun. There's actually quite a bit of history about White Rock in the local newspapers because the, um, the owner was a colorful character and he got in fights with his neighbors and so on. So um, for example, in the, in the 18, late 1870s, there's an article called Shotguns and Brass Knuckles at White Rock Vineyards from the Napa Register uh, talking about the neighbors fighting and how the, the owner of White Rock ended up having to get his brass knuckles out in order to break the jaw of the neighbor who came at him with the shotgun. So this is some real Wild West uh, period of Napa Valley, but uh, fun history for us to try to uh, uh, think that, about while that, we start this old property. Yeah, that sounds like a blast, that history. I mean, <laughs> brass knuckles and shotguns sounds like a, a party I may have missed out on in the 80s and 90s. <laughs> That is awesome. Sounds like one of my family reunions. Uh, I'm curious, actually, by the way, the angel bonus offer right now on the Seller Angels website is order six bottles, three bottles of the Shard, three bottles of the Claret, four and two, six and one, and then you get a complimentary tasting with Christopher at the picnic table. That might be a good time to do a vertical or you know, kind of experience that thing, or we can put together a vertical, as Denise mentioned in the chat, and, and take care of that. I want to, Christopher, dig deeper into the claret now that we're moving on to the red and and learn. I mean, you worked at a fantastic winery in Bordeaux, Chateau Pop-Clement, and and it's one of my favorite. Denise and I, it's the first winery I ever bought futures from. Uh, Didn't have a clue what I was doing. Uh, Didn't realize I had to wait 15 years before I could actually drink them. Uh, There wasn't a single bottle in the case that lasted beyond seven years or something like that. I mean, I couldn't wait. But uh, I'm curious when you're sitting there in such hallowed ground uh, in the, you know, one of the greatest wine regions in the world, what you continue to, to learn and, and try to impart when you're making this claret and some of your other wet red wines. Well, I have very different micro terroirs here, micro climate uh, sections of the blocks. Um, I've got uh, upper hillside east facing that um, has really ripe uh, tannin uh, Cabernet flavors, but red fruits and a really long lean structure. Um, That is uh, the core of my Cabernet Sauvignon. Uh, That is another wine that I sell. And then I've got another hillside facing west, so it gets baked in the afternoon sun. And um, the the hotter temperatures of the ripening window um, mean that it gets really dark black fruits, black plum, licorice, um, and, and really rich, uh, fatter, riper tannin structure. So kind of a more of a, what you think of as a Napa Valley, rich, soft Cabernets. That would be the Laureate and Cave Hill. Um, And then the Claret, as I said, is the Cabernet down at the bottom. That's really more, uh, it's it's a Cabernet destined for blending um, in the sense that that uh, it's just cold down there. So you you get these wonderful cold climate aromatics from the Claret and and then blend around it. But I mean, one of the fun things about Bordeaux in some ways is that you go there and they've done so much experimenting over the last 200, 300, 400 years that they already know how to do everything, you know? So you get to see someone sort of add a period of their career where they're, um, it's not that they're following a recipe because they have the same um, challenges that we do with vintage to vintage, but um, they're very confident in the way that their blends are gonna go together. And when I came back here, I was not confident at all. In fact, I wanted to be on, I wanted to have the uncertainty of being forced to experiment. Uh, so it, I have 22 acres of red grapes here and I make 30 different lots of red wine. <laughs> wow. Some of them are five, five tons, but most of them are less than a ton <laughs> because there's just so many differences. And, and, I, and I love, I, that's, to me, that's the fun part, you know? I mean, we, we go through our, blo- our vineyard um, the day before the actual harvest date, uh, we go through with uh, forks and, and little clippers and we take off all the raisins because I hate raisiny flavor in wine. And we'll, we'll take those raisins off and then we'll make wine out of them and sell to somebody else. And um, then, uh, so that, that's about 10% of my crop that just comes off because it got you know, heated. You know, when it gets to 100 degrees in Napa Valley, grapes get a little burned and we take right. those off. Um, but, uh, and then I do at least two block, two fermentations from each block. And, um, I just, uh, to me, it's fun. It's what makes it interesting. 
So who was the first person to call you like the mad scientist? <laughs> oh, I, I, I mean, uh, my friends used to call it White Rock University. <laughs> <laughs> Because well, I had a bunch of a bunch of friends wanted to learn how to make wine, and they would just come up, and I would be the one trying to trying to tell them how to do it. <laughs> well, and don't try to keep be, your friends anything. <laughs> it's it's interesting because you're right. You look at Rioja, where you worked harvest. You look at Bordeaux, and they do have three, four hundred years of having made these mistakes already, and, and having learned from all the iterations and pivoting and iterations and pivoting to where now this is your family estate. And the first couple of ones I, I had to imagine were white knuckled because you didn't want to screw anything up and, and try to figure out, okay, we're, how do we make wine, number one? And then how do we sell it, number two? That had to be a little bit of nerve wracking. Yeah, you know, I was, I was cocky young kid. <laughs> I had good mentors. The, 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 previous winemaker, Doug, the previous winemaker, Doug Danielak, is a great guy. Um, he's oh, yeah. behind Knightsbridge Winery and a couple other places, but he... Um, he was here for 10 years. So I had the benefit of his experience and wisdom guiding me. Um, and he, uh, you know, he had already done a lot of experimenting himself. So uh, I, I really did. I'm really standing on the shoulders of giants here, I have to say. No, that's a good point. And out of the buildings in 2017, have you been able to rebuild and or did you leave them down and, and wait? And what, what's happening with kind of when people come and visit, what are they going to see? Well, the, the, yeah, basically the buildings have been rebuilt. In fact, in the in the that video in the vineyard earlier, that the, the um, image quality was a little bad, but um, that um, is the stone winery from the 1870s, and it's been fully rebuilt. It's my parents' house, uh, so we're very happy to have done that. L very luckily, even though the buildings did burn, the gr the vines did not burn, and that means that the vines are the economic engine of our business. And as long as they keep producing great wine, then we'll be able to rebuild things in the course of time, um, you know, keep on going for another 150 years. I was just going to ask, are there any future family members that are, that are coming up through the ranks and, and walking the vineyards like you and your brother did? <laughs> I, my son did, did spend a couple hours working this morning out in the vines. He's 12. Um, but, uh, you know, the, my, I think the key probably to m the, the reason that my brother and I came back into the business was that my, my father was never, he never tried to force us to be part of it. He encouraged us to go do other stuff in life. And, and we went to college and then we both somehow came back. And I think uh, that we're probably going to do the same thing. I, uh, forcing your kids to work in the family business. I don't think that's the right technique. <laughs> no, that usually doesn't end well for either the parent, the business or the child. <laughs> yes. uh, exactly. So on the Chardonnay, we, we gave it a little bit of flavor profile. What foods would you pair with the 17 Chard? Uh, well, I mean, actually both those wines are gonna be very versatile because of their complexity of flavor. They, they both have crispness, they both have some a little bit of plump richness, they've got, got riper flavors and some more um, citrusy, lemony, in the Chardonnay case, citrusy, lemony character. So it's gonna actually be very versatile with food. Um, I mean, I think the standard rules apply uh, generally with the Chardonnay. Um, so fish and fish and vegetables, and uh, I, I, t I actually didn't come prepared to give you a recipe specifically designed for those wines. I'm sorry, I should have. I've got them in a database somewhere, the ones we picked out, but it's been about six All months since I thought about it. No, 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 that's fine. Um, yeah. claret, I definitely with the claret. I would encourage you to be um, to be ex to experiment with the claret because it because of its lightness and the and the and the, the bright characters in it. It will, it'll pair well with things that you wouldn't think necessarily would work with a red wine. I'd try it with salmon. I'd, I'd try it with some, um, some roasted vegetable dishes and stuff like that. It's got a lot of, it's going to work well with spicy, uh, some spicy foods. Do you have a, this is a, a tough question. Like when you're drinking your wine, do you have a go-to? Oh, it's all about the weather pretty much. And, <laughs> and who I'm trying to impress. <laughs> and you're trying to I, you know i like them all I, I think of them all as sort of very different characters like in some ways maybe we maybe the, there's this play like a shakespearean drama and you know yago is one of my wines and you know hamlet's another and and they're all very different from each other and i like them you know for their individuality <laughs> I, I can appreciate that and how do folks come see you if, if they're out in the valley and they want to set up a tasting 
Oh, they can just look, take a look at our website and we've got links to the email there. You can email me, Christopher at whiterockvineyards.com. Um, we're by appointment only. We do very few tastings actually, about 10 a week. So um, make sure to do that in advance. But um, for small groups, we're happy to have you. And, and it's kind of fun. You'll, you'll get into the cave and into the, into the vines and, and um, you know, see what's really happening. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a magical little tour and it's, you don't have to walk very far. I mean, the cave in and of, of itself and all of us have seen and been in a lot of caves, but it's pretty spectacular when you see four or 5,000 bottles stacked up like they are behind me. You walk by it very gingerly because it's a little bit like Tetris and you're afraid that if you pull one out, all of them are going to come cascading down, uh, which would be my luck. But um, that tasting table sitting out there in the shade it is perfectly positioned uh, to sit out and, and knock off an afternoon because it's just a, a great venue to explore. And, and being 10, 15 minutes outside of downtown Napa is, is ideal. Um, well, Christopher, this has been a treat. Thank you so much for, for giving us a little bit of insight into you and the family and, and the vineyard specifically. Uh, aptly named, I'm sure you didn't have to struggle very hard to name White Rock because it is abundant where you are. Uh, so I applaud you for that. And I want to uh, toast you to your success, your perseverance, your resistance and resilience, because uh, I know it's been a tough few years since 2017 with earthquakes and fires. So thanks so much for, for persevering. Cheers. Thank you so much. And just to let everybody know, next week, we are broadcasting live from Napa Valley. So if you thought the, tonight's episode was riddled with technological gaps, wait until you see next week when we don't, when Mission Control will be four or five glasses deep by that time. Uh, and, and we're going to be having a film crew, actually. We're going to be trying to live stream via laptops and very expensive cameras, professional lighting. Uh, so it should be quite interesting, if not an utter train wreck, but we will give it a go. And uh, I want to thank Christopher again. The wine is spectacular. Do yourselves a favor and hit the angel bonus offer on Cellar Angels uh, because this is a worthy place to stop by and, and, and taste, especially with this backdrop. Uh, vines there since 1870 and you, you can't miss. It's just a family production that is really something to behold. So cheers, everyone. Stay safe. Thank you so much Here. for all your support. Have a great weekend and we'll talk Look soon. Forward. Cheers, everyone. Look forward to meeting you.